So thank you everyone for being here. Um, it's after lunch. I hope you had a good lunch. And I was worried, you know, people would be stuck in lunch and maybe uh, wouldn't be coming here. But we have a good uh, number of people here. So thank you for, for making it. Uh, I'm very excited to talk about this um, Zero Trust APIs. So I've been working with a lot of companies recently, uh, doing a lot of work designing, building APIs and securing them. And, and I get to realize we, we are not really good at, we haven't cracked API security yet, really. And so a lot of APIs I get to work on, the, there are surprising vulnerabilities in there that uh, shouldn't really happen. So what I'm trying to do in, in the past couple of years, I'm trying to raise more awareness about API security vulnerabilities and how they happen and what we can do to prevent them. And so here I'm going to put, present this zero trust model uh, for uh, uh, zero trust security model for APIs, uh, see what it means for APIs and what we can do to make them more secure. Uh, before jumping into the details, let me introduce myself a little bit. My name is Jose. I'm the author of two books, Microservice APIs, was published in December 22, and Secure APIs is coming up uh, soon. So I'm, as, as we speak, I'm finishing chapter five. It's available on early access in, on manning.com. Uh, and if you want to get a copy of, uh, of any of these books, you can use this discount code to get a 45% discount. But also the best part is my, um, I was able to get my publisher to give me uh, 15 access codes to, to the books. So 10 access codes for secure APIs and five access codes for microservice APIs. I'm going to do a giveaway. If you want to participate on, on the giveaway, connect with me. Send me a message on, on LinkedIn or by my email or something. Let me know that it is because of your Python and you want to participate in the giveaway. And I'll announce the, the winners in a few days. Um, I also publish courses on, uh, on in the process of building them uh, on API security and development. So learn.microapis.io is where I put, I'm going to put the courses. And I also have a YouTube channel where I put uh, tutorials on API security and development as well. Um, if you want to connect with me, any of these platforms, so uh, b the best way I think is on LinkedIn. Uh, you can do by email as well or, or Twitter if you want to uh, have any, uh, any questions about APIs or security. Uh, now, API threads is something I've been working on for a, few, uh, for a while now. I'm hoping to launch in a few weeks. So the, the idea is to help uh, to raise awareness about API security. So it's completely free. You can register for free. And every two weeks, we're going to have challenges. So every two weeks or so, we're going to have a new API. We have to discover vulnerabilities by interacting with the API. And then the following week, we, we, we have to find the, the, the vulnerability in the code and, and find, find out how to fix the vulnerability. And so among participants, I'll try to run also giveaways of books and whatever I can uh, raffle. So all right, so the agenda for today, um, I want to give you first a little bit of introduction. What's the current state of API security and why it is important to focus on this a lot more now? Uh, and then I'm going to present this model of zero trust security and how it applies to, uh, to APIs. And then we're going to see examples. I think this is the best part of the presentation for me. We're going to see, um, I put together um, a vulnerable API where we can showcase some of these vulnerabilities and see how they work and how we fix them. And then importantly, we're going to see how we can discover some of these vulnerabilities ahead of time uh, with two different testing strategies at design time and at runtime. And I'm going to show you the tools. All right. So, uh, the problem we have these days is APIs are everywhere. It's just the way we build applications. So the um, the you know we have APIs to run integrations between microservices, um, to expose functionality for an a for an SPA or for a mobile application, and and so it's just the way we build applications these days. And depending on what you look at, uh, Cloudflare and Akamai have different st statistics for this, but. Uh, it's anywhere between 60 and 90 percent of all internet traffic is going through APIs, and those are it's a huge attack surface. Those are interfaces that expose sensitive data, sensitive functionality, and we ha really have to do a good job of protecting them. Otherwise, we have major holes in our systems. Um, and so, unsurprisingly, according to various analysts, the APIs are really the main attack vector on the internet today. With this, I just want to give you an idea of how complex API security is. So Salt Security is um, one of the main vendors in the API security space. They publish research every year on the state of API security. One thing to find here is that around 80% of all the attacks against APIs are authenticated. And so it's like for all intents and purposes, um, threat actors look like normal users when they are interacting with the API. And really, threat actors don't want to be they don't want to be found out as a threat actor. They know there's valuable data and functionality behind the API. So they, they are very interested in not hitting the rate limiting policies we have in place or 
throwing some kind of um, specific attack that is going to flag them as a threat actor uh, very quickly. So they're just going to try and interact with the API as, uh, you know, as normal as possible, but exploiting vulnerabilities that are there by design. And so what we have to do, really, to protect ourselves against these situations is to try and design APIs in such a way that we mitigate as much as possible by design the, the risk of exploits. And so uh, part of that is what, what we're going to see today. If, we, if you search online API security by design together with my name, you're going to find also some talks and webinars I've done around this topic from a more uh, specification point of view. Um, right, so how does Zero Trust help us here? So first of all, Zero Trust security is a concept that goes back to the early uh, 2010s. So John Kindervac was working at Forrester Research when he coined the concept. Back then, the idea for uh, enterprise companies was to do security with the concept of segmentation. So imagine we have applications or data sources that are very sensitive, and so we put them in, in isolated networks. We still do these things today, right? We put our database in a private network, for example, so that, so that nobody can access that data source. But what he, what he realizes is this isn't enough. You know, we still have interfaces to those data sources in form of uh, websites or things like that. If those, if those interfaces are vulnerable to SQL injection and other forms of attacks, you know, the point of segmentation is, is pointless because we are still able to break into the database. And so what he, what he brings up is the idea of zero trust security. So don't trust anything. Don't trust any data, uh, any request coming to your system, regardless of the region, and always validate everything. And so we can apply this to, to APIs. This is a diagram from my upcoming book, Secure APIs. If you have uh, feedback on this, please let me know. And so the, what I'm trying to highlight here is we have different data flows in an API. So we have a request flow, data coming from a user to the API. We have a response flow, data coming from the API to the user. We have third-party API flow. So we are connecting constantly to external APIs, like geolocation APIs, emailing APIs, payments APIs. Those APIs are as vulnerable uh, to data corruption and other forms of attacks as our API. And so when we're connecting to those APIs, we have to make sure we're validating and, and sanitizing that data as much as we can. We have a data flow with our own database. And we, we often don't think of it, but there are so many ways things can go wrong in a database. Even with a simple migration, we can corrupt, poison, or get data in a bad shape that is going to co compromise the integrity of our systems. So we have to make sure those things are also looking right. And we have a data flow also with other systems, with, with other, um, other services within our system. So an example here with a user service could be a payment service or something else. Those, service, those services are as vulnerable as our own service, and we have to make sure we are validating everything in there. So we have all these data flows. The question is now, how do we, how do we protect them? And so this is a, a list of all the uh, kind of the security principles we can have for, for APS from a zero trust point of view. Uh, we don't have a lot of time here, so I think the best thing is they are kind of self-explanatory. So when you get the slides, they are uploaded already on, on the website and they are available in Discord. So read through these and then check out this image, this diagram, and spend a few minutes here. This contains illustrations of each of those principles and how they, they can be vulnerable um, in an API. But let's jump into, into the examples now. I think that's the exciting part. So if you scan the QR code or go to this short URL, you're going to be uh, prompted with um, You're going to go to a readme file here. Um, it contains the vulnerable API that I put together for this presentation. And you can access, so it tells you how to clone the API, uh, the, the code, how to run it. You can access the API as well on the cloud, apithreats.com example 01. And that's what we're going to work um, today here. So we're going to see the, the short URL is in, in every slide, so don't worry if you can't catch it now. So we're going to see the examples now. The, the, the main point here is sometimes we design APS in a way that is not obvious how they can be exploited. And we put parameters and, and properties in, in the models that are not sufficiently constrained or not sufficiently um, protected to, to prevent a different kinds of exploits. So we're, we're going to see illustrations of that here. So we're going to begin with pagination attacks. So this represents a kind of e-commerce API. To interact with it, we're going to have to authorize our requests. So if you go to api, API threats.com login, you're going to have to log in, and you're going to get an access token. And so if you grab these and then click on authorize here, you put the your throat. Oh, all right, okay. Um, sorry, can we fix, how, could, how do we fix that? Okay, all right. So here we are, pagination endpoint. So like any good 
collection endpoint in an API, we have uh, pagination parameters here. So we, there are different ways of doing pagination, right? We can do page-based, cursor-based, token-based. This is just with pages. And so we can select which page we, we want to look at, how many items per page we want to see, and how we want to sort the items. So if we try this out, we send a request, and we get the list of items. I don't have a huge amount of items in the database. It's only two. But we're going to be able to illustrate things nonetheless. Right, so these are the pagination parameters. Just as, it, just as, as it is, and there are so many APIs that are just like this, I can do something like this. I can come and say, give me 100 million items per page. I only have two. It's a, it doesn't really showcase it. We, would, we wouldn't have time to wait for the, for the loading and everything. But in a normal API with a lot of data, this, this would go through. And one of these requests is not a lot of problem. But two, three, a hundred, a thousand, maybe a million of those requests against the database is going to cause substantial pressure on, on the database. Right, so that's one thing we can do. Now, something interesting also. Let's say we do zero or minus 100, and that's going to cause a server error. Now, these are interesting ways to create unexpected behaviors in the servers. In this case, it's going to cause a server error. In some other cases, it's going to cause different behavior. And these are ways also to disrupt the, the experience of the service for, for the users. There's something interesting we can do also with order by. So here is price. A UI is going to control these choices for the user, right? We can put name, and we sort the items by name. We can do also something else, let's say ASDF. You know, a threat actor is gonna go directly to the API, it's gonna try different things. And this is very important feedback, if the server has crashed. So it means it's checking on any value here on the order by, and it's trying to sort things by that. Now we know here this is gonna be correlated to the columns on the database, so we can try and discover properties that are hidden, that are supposed to be private to the, to the data model. So something that I know exists here is, is, is exclusive, for example. Yeah, I'm waiting before hitting. Right, so it's exclusive, and we hit execute, and it works. All right, so now I know with this I can do what we call a schema enumeration. So I can discover internal properties of a system that are not supposed to be publicly available, and with this I can put together a mass assignment strategy, or I can um, do the things like, for example, it, 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 there may be some private property that is in an e-commerce the date of launch, for example, and I can sort items by date of launch. If I have a scalper bot, something that is going to buy out the whole stock of a product and then sell it at a higher price, this happens commonly, right? So I can monitor the, for example, the, the dates of launch and and, uh, and adapt my my bot to to buy out the products when they're going to be released. So I can do things like that. Why is this happening? So if we go to the um, to the presentation here, these are the examples. You can try them on on, on your own. So the problem is, this is fast API. It's going to work the same in, in, any, in any other framework. So I have the, the parameters. They are optional. They have a type, but they don't have any kind of constraint. So what we want to do, um, but hopefully you can see, right? The, so what we want to put is constraints. Every, every parameter has to have a minimum and a maximum value. And with the strings, what we can do is something like enumerations. This is a great way of constraining user input on those parameters. So in some cases, it won't be possible. We may want to have something like a filter parameter that allows us to do a free filter on description and such. In those cases, we want to have uh, parameterized queries on the database to prevent SQL injection, but we want to make sure we constrain as much as possible user input. In the case of page, even, we want to have a maximum number of pages. We, we don't want users to come around and scrape the whole database of products in our system. So once we do that, we have a response like this, for example, for, the, for this uh, order by, we do ASDF and it's gonna tell us, no, no, only two options here. So you're not going to do any weird thing uh, here. Right, that's pagination attack. Let's move on to the next um, case. SQL injection plus BOLA. BOLA stands for broken object level authorization. So if you go to a WASP, the top 10 OWASP are APIs, one of the first is broken object level authorization. That is when you can access data from other users, data that you shouldn't be able to see. So we have an order endpoint here. And if you're on a laptop and you authorize your request and, and such, you can place orders through the API here. We will be able to see them. Um, as we are typing. So what I, what I can go is to the orders API, and I can list my own orders, right? So with this, it's not authenticated, so let's go and paste the token. That's, that's when I, I stopped before. So authorize and close. And now I send a request, and I have access only to my own data. Uh, but here we have a, a status of the order, right? I can see if I can filter uh, basically orders by the status. But I can do some interesting things also. I can say, what happens if I sort by uh, as the status is 10? 
All right, that's telling me it's accepting any kind of input. Now let's see if we can put a SQL injection attack here. So we if, if you think about SQL uh, injection, how it would happen is we are doing string interpolation in our queries, right? So we're going to put the, the value of the parameter we want to, in to insert in quote marks. So if we are smart here, what we're going to do is close that quote mark, and we're going to say or 1 equals uh, 1. This is the most basic SQL injection attack. And we close the rest of the statement. So if I do this, now I have access to all the orders in the system from everyone else. And, and so this is interesting, right? But we could do even more things. I can say and uh, 3133 um, equals Select. It looks very weird. I'm just going to send a sleep statement to the database. Select 3133 from PG is a Postgres database. Every database will have its own. So this is something we can help. It, it helps us also, also discover the type of database we have in the system. So PG uh, sleep, uh, sleep for four seconds because we don't have a lot of time. We close the rest of the statement. We send this. And now the database is going to sleep for four seconds before returning. Now, this looks completely harmless, but if we do this across hundreds of requests, we're going to run out of the pool of connections with the database. If we put it to sleeping for 30 seconds or more, we're just going to prevent other users from engaging with the system. And we can do even something more interesting here. We can say, if the screen comes back, or 101, we can combine with the previous uh, attack. And this, so we send this, it's going to wait for four seconds, and it's going to return all the data. Now, what, what's going to happen here is if we have a system, you know, if this is a production e-commerce API and we have millions of records here, it's going, to, it's going to load them all of them in memory in the database. It's going to wait for a few seconds before returning. So at some point, the database may even run out of resources and may just collapse. And so this is very interesting uh, kind of things we can do with, the, uh, with SQL injection. Um, so you have the illustrations here. You can play around with them as well. Now, why is this happening? So we have these row SQL statement here with the string interpolation. We're building the query as we go, depending on the, on the value of the status. And, and you may come and say, but Jose, this doesn't happen in reality. You would be surprised. Um, especially with you know, data science, machine learning applications, the, that's where I see a lot of these. And sometimes for, you know, it's, a lot of the time we are gonna use ORMs, right? With Django or SQL Alchemy to, to do the parametrization. I'm really sorry about this. I don't control the system. Um, but sometimes we don't want to use the ORM. The, comp the query is so complex, we want to have a row query. And sometimes we just forget to parameterize the query. And so we expose the system to this kind of thing. It's perfectly possible. It happens in, not in many cases, but quite a few cases. Um, and there's also, you know, a debate this uh, continuously whether we should use ORMs or not. And the problem is in, in the hands of more junior developers, they may forget to parameterize the queries. So that's the, the risk I want to highlight here. Um, with, with those things. And, then, and of course, the, the other thing we want to do here is um, we want, so we want to parameterize the queries, in this case with the, with the ORM, but we want to constrain user input by design. So by design, we put an, an enumeration here. Nobody can come here and play, start playing with SQL injection attacks. It's, it's by design, it's not, prevent, it's not possible. So we're going to get this kind of response. It's not possible. Right. Um, Ten minutes left. Let's see how far we can get. Let me, I want to show you an example of mass assignment um, in, in something that actually happens a lot more than, than it should. So, you know, when we're, when we're building APIs with, Python, with Fast API or Flask or, or Django, we have plugins or libraries that allow us to define data validation models. And that's how we should be defining the input and the output of the API. A lot of the time, I see APIs that don't have clear models for input and output. And so anyone can send a random um, payload and um, and get the properties to pass through. So let me show you an example of that here. So if we, pl if we place an order, we grab a, a real product ID from here. And so we're going to place an order. And right, so that's the order placed. And then we can grab the ID of the order. And I can go to the update, the state, uh, update operation. Now, the idea of the update is, is going to be controlled by IUI in real cases, right? So it's going to control how, you're, how we imp send input to the API. We're going to change only the product or the amount. But we're going to do interesting things here. We're going to say, when it comes back, um, right. OK, so I'm going to copy these. I don't want to change that data. But what I want to change is, um, hopefully you can see this well. 
So I'm going to change all the properties in the model. Because I, I notice, you know, I, I place the order, and I, I notice that the response payload is different from the request payload. There is a status property here. So I'm going to try to overwrite that status. And I'm going to say status is paid. And so I send this to the server. Um, uh, right, I, I, need the, uh, I need to remove this. All oh, right, also. Thank you. OK, so I send this, and the request goes through, and I set the status to paid. Uh, now, you're going to find, um, uh, actually, I should have said this earlier, maybe, but you know, the OWASP it has a, a vulnerable API called Crappy. You can play around with that API. It has similar vulnerabilities. It's implemented in Django, actually. So you can look into the internals of the API, how it is implemented. And so you can do a similar thing in the API. You can overwrite the status of the, of the order, and you get cash back without having to do anything else. So these are ways I've seen payments APIs where we are exposing the same uh, payload to the input and output. So the status of the payment is exposed to the user. So that means unless we have a very smart developer who says, all right, status is not something that should be coming through a post or a put request, by design, that API is vulnerable to uh, manipulations like this. And so what's happening behind the scenes is we have, um, I had to, to change the, the Pydantic model. So in version two of Pydantic, they're doing things very well to help us. So the model is, is, is strict. So we can't, you define your model, and you can't put additional properties in the payload. Uh, that's different of how OpenAPI actually works. So OpenAPI is based on JSON schema. The way JSON schema works is you define your model, you can put additional properties by default. You have to use special directives to prevent that. But Yantic is going to help us here uh, in version two. But also what we're doing in the body of the function is we're iterating over the keys and values of the properties in the payload and binding them directly to the, to the, to the database record. So if we use something like the same model for input and output, even if Pydantic is going to help us, um, by design, the API uh, is, is, not, is not helping us. So we are going to be able to over overwrite those properties um, in the request. What we want to do, we want to have a strict model in combination with explicit access to the properties that we expect in the request. So if we are not expecting a status, that doesn't show up here. Um, and we are explicitly, explicitly accessing the properties that we want. Right, with a few minutes left, very few minutes left, I'm just going to show you, there are some more examples. Uh, you can go through them, and I'm going to put more explanations on the readme, uh, but very quickly, to tell you a little bit about testing. So testing at design time and at runtime. At runtime is interacting with the API. At design time is by looking only at the API specification. So at runtime, I want to show you schema thesis. It's one of the tools I like to, do, to use for this. It's a Python package. And you just run uh, schema thesis with a simple uh, command against your API. You give it the API specification, and uh, it's going to do something like this. So it's going to go endpoint by endpoint, by checking if the API is accepting the right payloads and, and rejecting the, bad, the, the right payloads, and if it is returning the right type of data. This is super helpful to make sure that the API complies with the, the implementation, complies with the specification. Now, once we've done this and the API is absolutely correct from the implementation point of view, we can also go to the specification and we can test with something called Spectral. So it's an NPM package. So we do the installation like we do here, the configuration, and then we run it directly against the spec, and it's going to flag every vulnerability we have by design in the API. And this is the kind of thing we're going to find. So these are tests that I've run against public APIs, bank, banking APIs, insurance APIs, um, GitHub as well as here. So we're going to find anywhere from hundreds to thousands of design problems in, in the API. And what we have to do to make the API secure is just apply these changes. you know. And then by design, it is not going to flag everything. There are so many vulnerabilities that are not captured by Spectral, but it's going to highlight at least 50 or 60% of those design vulnerabilities. And you know, it's, it's a great way to get, to get our APIs in, in a good shape. Um, so these are just examples of running the Spectral against a specific APIs like NatWest, GitHub, Plate, and the, the kind of outcomes you get. Um, and there's some sources if you want to learn more about data breaches. Um, so Firetail, you're going to find the, the major data breaches in this website. Uh, HackerOne is a great source of information about vulnerabilities in APIs and across web development in general. 
And with a um, little bit of pain and effort, we made it through. So I hope it was, it was possible to follow through. Again, the discount code for the books. Connect with me and tell me you're coming from EuroPython to include you in the giveaway. And feel free to connect with me in any of these platforms. Thank you for listening. And questions. Thanks all for listening. It's now time for questions. You can line up behind the microphone right there. So um, you talked about API securities and everything. Um, do similar principles apply to like web sockets or, or because as, as long as I know in fast API, you just accept the WebSocket, and then the requests are like, you know, they flow freely. So, right. like, uh, so we used WebSockets in different situations, right? So we use it in GraphQL to connect to uh, changes to, to the state of, uh, of something, we could, uh, or in gRPC to establish the WebSocket and, and streamline the, so that we don't have to open a new connection every time. In that sense, it still applies. We are still exchanging data. So the, the socket is just a different way of making the connection. The data is still flowing through that connection. We want to make sure that data is correctly validated and manipulated in all cases. OK, so like every time a request, you, you accept like some data from the? Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, GRPC is going to help you, right? Because we have protocol buffers. So by design, we, we have, you're going to take care of a lot of validation. The only thing we want to make sure in, in, in GRPC is that we are designing those payloads securely. That's what we, yeah. what we want to do in that case. OK, yeah. thank you. Really interesting talk. Thank you. Not a question, but comment. You put a lot of sadness in my heart because when I saw these kind of scenes in the code, I was expecting them to be like specific, unexperienced developer. And you show that it's actually common practice. It, it's, it's a lot more common than we than we think. Yeah. The so depending on the application, like I say, in SQL injection is not it shouldn't be as widespread nowadays. But a lot of data science and machine. It's all just because the, we write the, the raw queries and we forget to parameterize. Uh, it, it's happened a few, a few times in, in previous projects. But what is also, you know, like, like, like I was mentioning, Fast API gives us Pydantic to do the data validation and everything. I still see a lot of APIs. We don't have the response model. We don't have the input model. Supposedly, the, the UI is going send to send us the right data. But we are giving up all this data validation layer that is going to come for free, and it's going to help us so much in, in securing our APIs. And of course, if we have the right models, make sure we are not exposing uh, server-side properties through the uh, input payload and things like that, it, we, we're going we're gonna to be able to do so much to protect the APIs. Uh, there, there are so many of these uh, things out there in the wild. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no more questions, let's give one more round of applause. Thank you. Don't forget.